and introduce our guest speaker for today. Lots of work for director. Uh, our director today. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. The Grand Erie District School Board recognizes the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe as the traditional peoples of this territory. We acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples for sharing these lands in order for us to continue to work here today. At this time, it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Nigan Sinclair uh, to our Grand Erie virtual learning community this afternoon. If you've ever followed Nigan's work or been present at one of his talks, he always leaves you with a sense of pride to want to do more and to learn more. And anybody he will teach, he enjoys anybody uh, to listen to what he has to say, and he takes the time to teach. In preparing, Nigan, for your virtual presence, I recall reading that you never really planned on being a teacher, but just sort of fell into the profession. First, working with young Indigenous students, teaching drama and English at Kelvin High School in Winnipeg. And following this, Nigan began teaching about his knowledge about Indigenous culture, he started writing and decided he wanted to become a graduate student and he kept on going, becoming a professor. And if teaching at the University of Manitoba wasn't enough, Nigan found that he enjoys teaching the public as well, writing biweekly columns for the Winnipeg Press as well as has an international presence. You once mentioned that what motivates you is essentially how Indigenous history is woven into every fabric of Canada, whether that's teaching non-Indigenous people that are influenced by Indigenous people or teaching Indigenous people the history and culture, how it is extremely important and how it is the foundation for Canada. And it is your lived experiences that we look forward to learning about you and from you to make the path easier for those who are coming. With this, our focus this evening is on revisioning Indigenous student success and looking at new practical and innovative models to move us forward. I'd also like to recognize Joe Tice, Indigenous lead at Grand Erie and Superintendent Monroe for coming together with a committee to offer this session to our new teachers and our community partners at large. Thank you. Nigan, we are here to listen to what you have to say and Chair Chimikwich, welcome. You muted uh, Nigan. And uh, before Nigan speaks, um, can we everybody uh, turn off their microphones and, and their cameras? Just because we have uh, 119 people on this uh, session today. So if uh, everybody can uh, mute their mics and turn off the cameras, it'd be greatly appreciated. You can put all your, your questions in the chat and we'll get to those later. Thank you. Great. Yep. See, I made the cardinal <laughs> to begin with. The I started with my traditional greeting, and then I was like, "But you're muted." So there you go. Well, creation heard me if you didn't. So there you go. So bonjour, dinaway, dinaway, magre, dok, ni gan, wey, wadam, dedish, na kas, na mulushen, do dem, ni menwen dem, o my ayen, karabach, bagi, gisna, zukupen, agujing. Bonjour, mesho masak, na komasak, mi janek ijek, na mi ji nebekwe. Anishinaabe and Dao, Bongi, Peglis, and Oji. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to share with you a little bit of language from my territory, which is over here in Treaty 1. Uh, and uh, we, of course, are the homeland of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oja Cree, the Dene peoples who have a little bit of uh, interaction with this area, the Dakota, the Lakota, of course, the homeland of the Metis Nation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, and all the uh, different uh, relatives that I, I send my wishes from over to you in your territory, which I know are partly Anishinaabe territory and, of course, shared with our Haudenosaunee relations. Miigwech for the beautiful prayer that started out today. Uh, it's always uh, great to hear uh, the Haudenosaunee language, particularly because uh, we share very deep relationships through the, uh, the treaty, the dish with one spoon. Uh, and we share relationships um, all throughout that territory in um, that predate Canada that go back, you know, 
probably about a thousand to eleven hundred years our relationships with the with the Haudenosaunee, our, our treaty relationships begin. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and spend some time with you today. Um, I find uh, Microsoft Teams a or a little discombobulating. So so like for instance, I don't see anybody, which I know your cameras are off, uh, but I will definitely not see anybody when I start to share my slides shortly. And um, it's been a crazy day for us over here. We had a uh, uh, a death of one of our relatives in the prisons on the weekend. So I've been spending the morning uh, with the family and um, they're from my 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 mother's community. And uh, so, yeah, so there's been it's been a hard time over here. And also about two hours ago, uh, one of the tent cities that we work with in the city, uh, I work with the Mama Bear Clan and uh, it had a fire and somebody passed away this early this morning. So anyway, it's been a very crazy day over here, uh, but I'm real happy that we're able to spend a little bit of time with you, uh, particularly because uh, I get to spend a time talking about things that I love, which is change and innovation and and re uh, areas of reconciliation. So I'll be able to spend a little bit of time that before I go back out on the streets to be able to tell the story about the fires in Tent City last night. So uh, let me just share my screen here. So I'll share my screen. Here we go. Um, uh, can you just confirm that uh, you can see my slides? Joe, maybe can you just let yeah. me know? see it yep okay so you can see perfect. this right now perfect okay great um okay so uh let's get started uh so my name is negon sinclair and i'm a, a professor i'm also a writer with the winnipeg free press and i also do a number of other things in our community i do curation at the forks historical site national national historical site i'm the indigenous curator there i'm also the indigenous curator of the royal aviation museum of western canada which is all about flights and air travel to the north and working with indigenous communities as well as i do uh you know hundreds of visits to classrooms and school districts such as yourself uh, and so this is my opportunity to do some things that i really love because uh yes i'm a recovering school teacher um i've realized that i'm going to be here in march with you so i'm going to save some of my stories about being a, a teacher till my sessions in march i believe it's march 26th so uh, I'll be I'll be sharing some stories about what it was like for me to be as a teacher uh, and what well, the things I most often consider to be the hardest profession in the world, which is to be an Indigenous teacher because you're expected to do four times the job as everybody else. I'll get to that on March, but I want to give a little tip of the hat, a little taste of what that looks like over here. But what I really want to talk about today is some of the public work that I do in terms of education and reconciliation and how I think that the problem in schooling is what we expect, uh, the expectations that we bring to Indigenous students and frankly non-Indigenous students because we're having the wrong conversation and we're having the wrong conversation around uh, what are we trying to get, to get, what's the outcome? What are we trying to get to a point in which we get students to? And if we don't modify that outcome, that expectation of that outcome, uh, frankly, it really doesn't matter all the things that we do in the meantime, because uh, success is the, is about definition. What do we define as success? And we're going to find out, hopefully, through this talk today, that uh, Indigenous peoples don't expect a diploma. That's not what we expect when we come out into schooling. And so that's a significant change. And it really doesn't matter what nation you're talking about. It talks about Indigenous peoples as, as a whole. We uh, A diploma may be a part of what we hope to get out of our relationship with schooling, but it's much different than that. It's much more than that. So, And I would say non-Indigenous peoples generally go to school for a diploma. So the, the issue is that we may be tailoring schools for non-Indigenous peoples, which is why Indigenous peoples are not succeeding. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute. But um, I just want to talk briefly about what uh, indigenous studies or the areas of indigeneity or indigenous education. What is required of us when we do when we start beginning this conversation around indigenous education? This is stuff that I do. Uh, and uh, like I said, I do a lot of work with educators, do a lot of work with curriculum. Uh, I wrote a curriculum with Inspire, the Assembly of First Nations and so on. Um, so like if you want to know my my CV, here's my CV right here, but you've already heard my CV, you've already heard things that I've done and and uh, where I work, where I worked to, you know, Kelvin and that sort of thing. But um, as an Indigenous educator, you're expected to be able to speak on two different levels, many different levels, in fact, but I would say two specific levels in the world of today. 
The first is what I call the macro level, the big picture ideas, the, the where are we going kind of ideas. And uh, this is an example of, of this kind of conversation. This was uh, me speaking at The Hague in the Netherlands. So that's the world court, that the world court in the in the Netherlands, of course, that's where the war crimes tribunal was post Germany. Uh, but this is a conversation involving indigenous rights uh, at discussing the United Nations Declaration, particularly. And so there's judges, lawyers, world leaders. Uh, I remember speaking um, alongside the Canadian delegation. So I had the mayor of Calgary on one arm. I had a former governor general, Adrian Clarkson, on the other uh, other side of me. Anyways, so we had major discussions on the, at the World Court around Indigenous rights. That's the kind of knowledge you need to bring to conversations on Indigenous education. You got to understand Indigenous rights. You got to understand internationally how it works. You got to understand nationally how it works. You got to understand how it is that 100% of every single project in the country um, mines, roads, infrastructure of any kind, every single inch, every single drop of water, every single breath of this country involves Indigenous rights. If you don't understand Indigenous rights, frankly, you don't belong in government, you don't belong in, in any leadership position in any place, in any system, in any institution, and if you don't understand Indigenous rights, you can't make informed decisions. You're, you're frankly, and I say this in the kindest way possible, you're incompetent. You're incompetent to be able to deal and handle the issues of today because every single aspect of the country involves Indigenous rights and you got to be able to understand that. So, uh, and I would say it, it is remarkable to me how 90 to 95% of Canadians don't have any clue of what Indigenous rights are, how they're employed, how they're defined by the Supreme Court. And frankly, then they make big, huge decisions and it involves a whole lot of conflict. No surprise. They don't know what they're doing. And that's not to say they're bad people. It's just to say they haven't been prepared adequately. It's like uh, it's like expecting police officers and paramedics when they walk up to situations involving Indigenous peoples. If they don't understand that there is a historical mistrust there, there's also a huge amount of historical structural racism within those systems that have conditioned police officers and firefighters and everyone working in the healthcare industry to think of Indigenous peoples in a particular way. And therefore, Indigenous peoples will react in a particular way. It's almost like we're... We, we are not equipping our professionals properly, whether it be police, paramedics, politicians, everyday people working in school districts, whatever. So you gotta be able to speak on a macro level. That's just on indigenous rights. I haven't talked to you about language, culture, all those other things. But at the same time, it's not just about having the macro, the big picture conversations, but it's also this picture over here. So if you can see on the right hand side, uh, this is me speaking at Nietzsche Commons in Winnipeg, which is a restaurant in the North End. Uh, in the North End, of course, uh, this is where I work with a, an organization called the Mama Bear Clan. I also work with grassroots uh, Indigenous activist organizations. We, you know, I don't know more Winnipeg, for example, and other different other uh, land based organizations that are looking for Indigenous land rights. They're looking for uh, rights uh, involving murder, missing Indigenous women and girls, uh, various other things. Lots of issues around poverty, safety, violence, over incarceration rates. So you got to be able to have the the macro conversations, and you got to be able to have the micro conversations. You got to have the conversations about what it's like to live on the streets, what it's like to expect uh, to uh, you know be followed when you're in a Seven uh, Eleven. What is it like to be uh, in a place in which uh, massive poverty is surrounding you and, and one of the scariest things i think for our young people is that they are conditioned to consider themselves less than to be shamed of who they are they're con they're conditioned to think of success as being um, um much different than how their communities expect success to look like so this is particularly why indigenous professionals are so important at this time, people like Joe, people like who you're working with in, in the school district, people who are working all across the country, like myself, to be able to, and this is the picture on the bottom right hand, uh, left hand corner of your screen. Um, this is why Indigenous professionals are so important. This was my graduating class at the University of British Columbia. We are coming. However, there are still not a critical mass of us to be able to uh, uh, educate, to advocate, to uh, allocate different areas within the country and try to bring them up to speed. So what we need is we need allies. We need supporters. We're going to need people to stand beside us. We're going to need people to be able to become versed on issues. And so this workshop uh, and this session that we're spending time together and today and, and in March 
uh, is not just about awareness. And the last thing that I ever want you to think this is about awareness. This is about livelihood. This is about us working together effectively, making the best work possible and changing the country as a whole. None of that is about awareness. If, if we work on awareness, all we're ever going to do is become aware of the problem and never deal with the problem. And uh, one of the things that's most evident is uh, lots of people in positions of power are aware that racism exists, but then they don't do anything about it. And that's the challenge here is that we cannot just be aware that there is structural inequities, uh, racism, discrimination, problems that have led to this issue that we call reconciliation. We can't just be aware of reconciliation. We have to know how to do it. And that's what today is going to be about. So today is going to be about that, because at the end of the day, uh, we are all part of this future together. We're all part. We're all parents. We're all nieces and nephews and uncles and aunties and, and soon to be elders in our communities, soon to be decision makers or sometimes we already are. You know, like this is there's a reason why we're, we're all parents. And I think that is the greatest teaching lesson of all is that my daughter, my kids are going to be married to working beside living beside your kids. And what are they going to inherit? What are we going to do in our lifetime to try to create something meaningful? That's what today is about. And we don't have a ton of time. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually jump past a few slides here uh, because I just want to get to the good stuff first. Now, that was, of course, talking about uh, some of the issues involving the Wet'suwet'en territory out in British Columbia. So uh, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that probably in March. Hopefully when, you know, we have to remember this pandemic has really uh, shifted the conversation in lots of different ways. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to I'll just leave it there. I don't want to get too down the too dark hole of land rights and, and the situation involving a, a pandemic. And uh, anyways, so this is uh, Peter Jones and Peter Jones should be known in your area. Uh, he's one of the most important people of your area uh, where you are situated in uh, the former site of Upper and Lower Canada uh, in your area. You're also Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe territory. So. Kakawakanabe was his traditional name, Anishinaabe name. Uh, Peter Jones was uh, the very first Indigenous person to write a book in the country. He's the very first Indigenous person. Um, now, he's not the first person to publish a book. That's actually George Copaway, who was someone that Peter Jones taught. Uh, but shortly afterwards, it was uh, published posthumously, but Peter Jones wrote several books before George Copaway, and so uh, they didn't appear till after he had passed away uh, in 1856. But uh, Peter Jones was a remarkable, remarkable person, uh, and he was a Ojibwe who made the radical decision to convert to Christianity. And uh, for many people, they would be like, "Ooh, well, what does that mean? Uh, what kind of you know indigenous person is he uh, that he would convert to Christianity?" Uh, Converting to Christianity, uh, especially in this time period in the early 18th century, uh, was not in any way antithetical to Indigenous tradition. Uh, I think sometimes now we think of things as or, you have to be Christian or traditional. Uh, that's not the way Anishinaabe think about things. We think of things as and, as it's a constant series of adding things. Every new things we, we add, we become more Anishinaabe. In fact, the word Anishinaabe means the spontaneous people. The spontaneous people, Anishina, Anishinaabe, the spontaneous people, the people who have cause, who experience cause, and then they change. That's what spontaneity is. So think about all the things you've done that's spontaneous. Well, the Anishinaabe, what defines us as Anishinaabe is our innovation, our, our exposure to other things, whether that be Christianity, the internet, another Indigenous nation, whatever that might be. Every time we get exposed to something, we see a new view, we learn a new word, we, we learn, we have a new experience, we become more Anishinaabe because we take those things on our own terms and make decisions about it. That's what Anishinaabe means. So converting for Peter Jones was not an or, it was an and. It was an addition to his Anishinaabe life. And the reason why Peter Jones converted was because he saw no possibility in Anishinaabe surviving otherwise. We have to remember that the world of Anishinaabe, and frankly the word of the world of the Haudenosaunee, in the late 17th century was a dire situation. I would say the Haudenosaunee, um, you know, 
we're in a particularly difficult situation because of the growing American state and the betrayal that the Americans had with many Haudenosaunee communities, however, uh, and the affiliation with the British. I won't get into the deep dive involving that, but the fact is that after the War of 1812, so there was the American Revolutionary War, 1783, and then after the American Revolution, the, the sorry, the War of 1812, 1812, 1814, there was massive refugees, uh, many of them Haudenosaunee, many of them British, many of them who are allied with uh, those one of those nations, often Indigenous peoples, Sac and Fox, Potawatomi, Odawa peoples, uh, and then came into Anishinaabe territory traditionally held Anishinaabe territory. Of course, Haudenosaunee people frequently used uh, areas like known as Six Nations and, and so on across the river and so on and so forth. But it's that uh, for Kakwakanabe, what he witnessed, the Mississauga Anishinaabe, what they witnessed after the War, War of 1812 was a massive squatting on their territory, the flooding of Anishinaabe territories. And their, their way of life radically disrupted, uh, food lines in particular, leading to mass starvation. So we can see all the treaties that were negotiated post-1814 uh, were not really treaties. They were mostly land sessions, meaning uh, land, for, for the, in case of the British, land purchases, but they were uh, under the Royal Proclamation, the recognition that there was some element of Indigenous title in operation, and they had to freely purchase those lands off Indigenous nations. Of course, it was never freely because the lands were already flooded out and occupied. And there was no free declaration or, or discussion or negotiation. Um, but those treaties, those pre-Confederation treaties, most of them are uh, often deemed as land purchases. They're not meant to be in the same vein as peace and friendship treaties, or particularly the numbered treaties, which have certain elements in relation to Canadian law today. Many of these things involve just buying the land and then moving Indigenous peoples off to the side. Why? Because the British weren't really interested in Indigenous survival. They were interested in moving Indigenous peoples out of the way. Uh, pre pre predominantly to get them out of the way of development like Toronto, Hamilton, Niagara Falls, those areas, and then build industrialization. And then frankly, just hope the Indians die because for the most part, uh, they were dying en masse in many of these communities to the tune of 90%. So many indigenous communities uh, for the British, for Christians, for many Canadians or soon to be Canadians because they're still British citizens at this time, mostly thought Indigenous peoples would be would be kind of disappearing into the landscape. Now, that's not actually the case, of course, because Indigenous peoples, while the population bases did reduce in some areas, they also grew in other areas. And so uh, it's not that Indigenous people certainly didn't fight back and didn't resist that narrative. But the fact is that for Peter Jones, he didn't see a possibility in many Anishinaabe people surviving unless they had access to resources to enable change. Remember the uh, spontaneity thing I spoke about? So for P Peter Jones, he saw conversion as an opportunity. He saw conversion as an opportunity for Anishinaabe to continue their lives as nations. And yes, at times uh, there was certain collisions of discourses involving Peter Jones saying things like, well, maybe you should give up the drums or give up those relationships with things. None of that in any way would be deemed acceptable, uh, particularly from an Anishinaabe point of view, because you would constantly be engaging and bringing your, your things forward to in a relationship with Christianity. But uh, Peter Jones is a realist. He saw that there was a possibility in Anishinaabe surviving, and what he wanted was the best thing possible for the people. He also wanted the best thing possible for Haudenosaunee, who his sister was Haudenosaunee. Now, that being said, uh, I want to show you a small quote of what Peter Jones saw in 1840, uh, early 1830s, 1840. Now, what one of the things that he would do is he would uh, ask for schooling from the British authorities, uh, particularly the churches. And he would ask for schools to be built for uh, Anishinaabe people, also for, for Haudenosaunee peoples. And so what he what he was advocating for, went all the way to England to speak to royalty, the crown over there, and he said, I want schooling for Indigenous peoples. Why? Because he wanted them to be able to innovate, just like the same purposes for Christianity, to use to innovate, to change, to enable Anishinaabe to continue. And here's evidence of that. He wrote one day, he said he was sitting in a school and he saw something happen, and this is what he wrote down. It makes the heart of the poor Indian rejoice to see his child read in a book, to see him put the talk to paper, to see the talk go to a distance that makes him rejoice. I will give you one instance. 
At the River Credit, we have a station. A chief had a son who was instructed in our mission school after he was employed as a teacher in another school and went away more than 100 miles from his father. After a time, he wrote a letter to his father in the Indian tongue, which he did not know how to read. The father brought it to me to read for him, and while I read, the tears ran down his eyes, and he rejoiced to hear the talk of his son on the paper at a distance. Now, why am I reading this passage from uh, the 1840s to you here in 2021, and we're talking about indigenous education? Well, there is nothing more indigenous than this moment. This is like an indigenous guy, Kakwakanabe, telling a story about another indigenous guy, a chief, and a story about a letter that his indigenous son, Anishinaabe son, wrote to him uh, in Anishinaabe moment, in the language. It's not in English. It's not like using, uh, you know, the language of the colonizer. It was Anishinaabe people talking about Anishinaabe things in the Anishinaabe language and using school to do it. Now, if this isn't a vision for what Anishinaabe people are interested in school, I mean, all you need to see is that as a result of this experience, a father and a son grew closer at a time in which Indigenous peoples are being torn apart. People are dying, land is being uh, flooded out, and uh, communities are being separated. People, people are um, constantly under a duress, uh, a traumatic situation of fear, uh, turning away from one another. And in this moment, through education, Peter Jones sees something. He sees the future. He sees possibility, and he sees it through education. Now notice that he didn't say uh, the father saw the son graduate with a diploma and tears ran down his cheeks because that's not what Indigenous peoples want out of education. That's not what they want. What they want is relationships with each other, relationships with the land, relationships even at times with non-Indigenous peoples. What Indigenous peoples are seeking is relationality. They're seeking kind, uh, meaningful, uh, well-fed, well-cared-for, safe lives. That's what Indigenous peoples are seeking by going to the education system. That's what Peter Jones saw. He saw a vision. And you know what he saw? He saw you and I sitting here, maybe not on Zoom, but certainly talking in conversation about what does it mean to educate our children together. That's what Peter Jones saw. He saw a possibility of relationships existing in education, whatever that looks like. But it must be, it must be on Indigenous terms for Indigenous peoples to have success. We cannot simply just introduce a notion of success and expect Indigenous peoples to meet the bar. Here's why I know that. Uh, I come from a removed community. Uh, my community is called St. Peter's Indian Settlement, and it's now called Pegwas First Nation. But we were a community in 1817 which signed the Selkirk Treaty. That's this image right here in the middle of the top part of your slide there. Uh, and this treaty that we signed, which was the very first treaty of Manitoba, it was the creation of a relationship between non-Indigenous and Indigenous peoples on the Red River. And what it agreed to is that non-Indigenous peoples could live on the Red River because, frankly, they could not support themselves. I, I know that because they showed up in October of, 18, of 1806 trying to live in, the, like who shows up in Winnipeg in October? It's like minus 50 degrees outside right now. Uh, and you know, it gets that way starting in basically November. But whoever expected to live in Manitoba and get here in October is just a bunch of idiots. And so like, that's what non-Indigenous peoples began in that relationship is trying to think, oh, well, we'll live in this place. No, you don't, they almost died. Pe Pegwas had to carry most of the community down to Fort Pemina and have non-Indigenous peoples look after their, their brethren. And then the next year they came back and started building a relationship. Ten years later, they built the Selkirk Treaty. And what, what Selkirk said, Lord Selkirk, who was the head of the settlement, said to Indigenous peoples on the Red River, uh, let's build a life together. And Pegwas said, well, the way that we build a life together is we must trade gifts. We must offer relationships to each other. And most importantly is we must recognize each other's law. And 
for most for the most part uh, our my community did fairly well in that relationship we became we created one of the most successful farming settlements uh, all across western canada we're certainly way more successful than any non-indigenous farmers most of us had adopted christian names by that point uh, most of us had adopted uh, elements like a store for example we were able to sell our produce we were so successful in fact that the non-indigenous farmers wanted us out of their territory they wanted to dump us they wanted to get rid of us and so they used clauses with Within the Indian Act, also within uh, the Canadian statutes and the province of Manitoba, the government of Canada, the town of Selkirk, and they conspired and removed us off the land, even though we were thoroughly Christianized, we were thoroughly, most of us spoke, spoke English and several other languages, and we were so successful, but yet none of that matters. It really doesn't matter how many barometers Indigenous peoples get to, we will never be seen as equal. Let me say that again. It really doesn't matter how many barometers and how many degrees we get. It really doesn't matter how many PhDs I get. Uh, when I'm driving around the city, I still get pulled over because I resemble a suspect. I still get followed in the 7-Eleven uh, because I have a ponytail. Uh, I still, my daughter, uh, even though she goes to uh, a, a very wonderful school, she gets straight A's, she still, at the end of the day, has the potential of becoming a murdered missing indigenous woman in this city, in this country. What I'm trying to say is, is that we have to stop expecting indigenous peoples to reach a barometer that they never will, and it doesn't matter if they do. Uh, here's why we should expect indigenous, we should be expecting indigenous peoples to get successful on their own terms. And that's when we begin to see indigenous people succeeding. And that's what our community has began to do after the removal, we were forced to move to up, to, up the interlake uh, and rebuild our lives virtually from scratch. And the best successful ways that we have done that is we have done it on our own terms. And today, Pegasus First Nation, one of the most successful First Nations, certainly in Manitoba, in Western Canada, we own the horse track in the city, we own businesses throughout the city. We also own uh, many of our own uh, offices. We've built pharmacies, we've built uh, systems that can support our relatives downtown. Many of the, uh, the small Small community groups are supported by Pegasus First Nation to take care of uh, our relatives who are living on the streets, to be able to enable and engage, and we and we're in the process of taking over our child welfare system as well under C92. And so, for many of our community, our most successful initiatives are on our own terms. They're not based expecting to reach some barometers that other have others have for us. And that's the most enacting thing that we've seen in the country. The most enacting thing, most exciting initiatives of the country are when Indigenous peoples say, we are going to do this because this is the way in which our teachings, our community, our values guide us to be. And I'm thinking about some of the great projects on the Ogama Mekana project, which is uh, not waiting for Toronto to make a territorial acknowledgement, uh, certainly not waiting for Toronto to make decisions on whether they're going to recognize the fact that they're Indigenous uh, their very name is Indigenous. Uh, like the funniest thing in Toronto that I always get, sh you know, blown away by. Uh, Toronto, the Toronto Blue Jays did a territorial acknowledgement once a season. It's like, and they're like, we're good. And like, like the government in Toronto, the government in Ontario, you know, we can all talk a little bit about them and where they are. They cancelled the TRC implementation of curriculum and blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm not telling you that uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta are any better, but I can tell you that at least we make territorial acknowledgements every day. We also incorporate and do uh, some aggressive hiring of Indigenous educators. And, you know, the people that are thinking about innovation and growth, I think might be better served to look to areas where it's happening more aggressively and stop painting places like Thunder Bay as the problem. Because I think what's happening in Thunder Bay is some really exciting, interesting stuff. I just wrote the uh, Indigenous Education Plan for Lakehead District School Board. Pretty aggressive, pretty interesting. I don't know any other uh, education district in the country that's going to be able to commit to the things like they're about to commit to, uh, which is like mandatory language education, uh, mandatory uh, Indigenous education across the, the district and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, saying things like we have to commit to a full relationship to make sure that students uh, don't die like Team Tanya Talega writes about in Thunder Bay. We have to take aggressive stances in, in a situation that's become egregious. 
Uh, that's the kind of work that I think is necessary is work when Indigenous people stand up for what is according to their values, what is according to their community's decisions, and not waiting for people to make to agree or to recognize or uh, that, you know, if we expect politicians to save us, we're going to be waiting a long time. We have to act like how we've always acted as Indigenous peoples, which is that we've done so on our own terms. And, and what I mean by that is uh, our territories, for example, like uh, this is a really great map. I encourage you to take a look. It's called nativeland.ca. Uh, it's a wonderful website in which you can understand Indigenous territorial use. Uh, you can also understand the way languages operate and inter intermix with one another. You can also understand treaties and how treaties operate. But probably the most important thing of this map that I like is I like using the territorial lines because one thing you'll notice about Indigenous territories and nations is they overlap. And you're like, how does that work? Because if we saw a map of Canada and the United States, we would see a very distinct line, like it's permanent. There's people with guns standing there going, this is the line between these two countries. Never the two shall mix, never the two shall meet. Uh, they'll only meet according with guns. Well, Indigenous people somehow, miraculously, uh, indigenous nations made decisions and still had some inherent integrity in relation to each other, but yet they overlapped. We could have Cree territory and Anishinaabe territory right on top of it. We could have uh, Haudenosaunee territory and then Anishinaabe territory right there as well. Like, what does that look like? That sounds pretty, you know, how, like, can you imagine, just imagine this for a moment. Imagine that you have America and Canada sharing the same space. Like, who do you think is going to win that conversation? Which law? which anthem, which flag is going to be flown. You know, like uh, non-Indigenous nation states have no idea how to enact re relationality other than with guns to say, this is my land, that's your land, we're going to make a firm line, that's it. In fact, one of the most hilarious experiences of my life was in Winnipeg, you uh, you get in U.S. Customs on the, on, on the Winnipeg airport before you go to the United States. And, uh, you know, I fly so much, especially to the States. And uh, one of the uh, the guards there knows me very well from my public work with the Winnipeg Free Press and so on. Clearly, he knew who I was because uh, when I went up and I showed my passport, uh, he, he looked at me, he said, what do you want to do on my land? <laughs> I was like, you're in Winnipeg. <laughs> like, this is, first of all, it's not your land. Second is, like, this is... The whole concept that that's your land is even more colonial, even more terra nullius, even more, you know, erasing people's uh, perspective and how privileged it terribly is. But that's the kind of ideas that are built when you think of nation states as the only forms of identity. But na indigenous nations had this, ter you know, terribly incredible idea. I say terribly incredible idea, terribly innovative idea that uh, that you could somehow have two nations in the same space. And they'll both have integrity. Here's what that looks like. Cree and Anishinaabe, they meet every year, and uh, particularly here in Manitoba. And gifts would be exchanged, pipes would be smoked, uh, water offerings would be made. And then at the end, they would say, okay, well, where are we going to put the where are we gonna put the border this year? And the Cree would say, well, we had some more babies. Uh, we, you know, uh, had some more mouths to feed um, as a result of this year. We need the border to be moved from the tree line to the shoreline. And that means a whole swath of territory, I know. But next year, we'll talk about where the border will go, but we need a little bit more territory. And the Anishinaabe would be like, okay, that's fine. We had some sickness this year. We lost some people. Um, uh, we'll move the border this year. But next year, we're going to talk about where it goes. And they would have fluid mobile borders. Every year, they would negotiate where the border would be. Well, like, that is precisely how uh, the law of, a, of called Minobomadzewin, the Anishinaabe law of Minobomadzewin. The law of Minobomadzewin is that the good life, which is what that means, is only good when others have good life. That means I need the Cree to be healthy, to be fed, to have medicines, in order for my community to be fed, to be healthy, to be have medicines. Like, that's the way in which the good life operates. When everybody has a good life, the good life is possible. That's what Indigenous nationhood looks like. When others are doing well, we do well as well. It's not that I need to compete with guns to make sure that I do better than these people over here. I want you just to imagine what it would be like if uh, Donald Trump, now Joe Biden, really doesn't matter who it is, uh, <laughs> phones up Justin Trudeau and says, hey, where are we going to put the border this year? Uh, and uh, like, where are we all going to be living then? 
we'll probably all be living in Baffin Island somewhere and Inuit would be like, are you guys going home soon? Or, you know, whatever. <laughs> like that would be what it would look like. Like, uh, and if you think Joe Biden's better, let me tell you this story. Uh, Joe Biden refused Canada to get vaccines from Michigan because he said, we take care of Americans first. Uh, the virus doesn't care, President Biden, who gets the vaccines. Maybe we should vaccine everybody and work on everything and then we'll eradicate this virus together. But uh, just in case you thought Joe Biden was somehow better than Donald Trump, um, it, the bottom line of it is here is that we've got a, a, com a competitive atmosphere based on nation state isms and indigenous nationhood, much different, different kind of values, not better. I'm just saying different. And that different value looks to like this how this map looks so that you've got somehow some sort of integrity and all of this is, of course goes to education it goes to the sense of and that i spoke about before that indigenous communities every time we told a creation story every time that we enacted the lodge every time that we did a ceremony or played us you know uh, learned a song or shared that song we were always talking about more relationships with the world like uh, one of the metaphors that we often use for education is around looking at trees, right? Or, or understanding a tree or growing relationships with the tree. Uh, if you have a relationship with the tree, uh, here's things that you will learn. You can, I'm looking at a tree right now. You can see the tree, you can see the bark, you can see the roots, you can see the branches, but there's never a time in your life you're going to be able to see all the tree. Like you can go stand on the other side and stand with whoever's standing over there. You can learn from that person. They can be watching it forever, watching the tree. They can only teach you so much about the tree because two things have happened. One is you'll get a different perspective of the tree. So now you know a little bit more about the tree. The second is, is that since you've left this position, the tree continues to change and grow. Moss grows, squirrel builds a nest, uh, branch falls off. The tree grows as you leave. So that means that the tree is in a constant uh, sense of evolution and growth and change. Uh, and doesn't matter how much more you get to know about the tree, there's still more to learn. The only thing I can really tell you about the tree is that mystery is inherently a part of the tree. There is no finite finished point where we go, oh, OK, well, we're done learning about the tree now because the tree is growing. Therefore, it, your education is constantly changing. It's like your tree is the epitome of end. You're like, oh, okay, there's always more to learn with the tree. We learn something more this year. Learn something more this year. We somehow still enable and become who we fully are meant to be, but we're in a constant series of becoming. We're never at like a point of finish it. Like we're not like we're like, okay, we're finished now. Can you imagine if you said, oh, my identity's done now <laughs> or my... My life, uh, my sense of self is done now. Like, at what point does that happen? Because you're in a constant state of growth. That's why when we tell creation stories, every time our, we tell our creation story, we become more Anishinaabe. But there's no finiteness to Anishinaabe. Uh, the creation story tells us who we are, why we're here, who can help us, where are we going? And we're telling stories that we've been telling for tens of thousands of years. And we're still learning from those stories. Those stories are still growing. In fact, we describe those stories as beings. They're called atazuconic. Ick, that word ick at the end gives a sense of animacy. So these are actually alive beings. Our creation stories are alive beings that we walk with for a while, and then they walk with someone else for a while. Um, that's why our sense of Anishinaabe is a sense of life. It's growth. And that's what education is meant for us to do. Is our education system is meant for us to constantly change and shift. And it really doesn't matter what Indigenous nation we're talking about. The Canadian Council of Learning did a really great job a number of years ago, back in 2007, publishing different models on Indigenous education. And um, of course, there is nuance. Of course, those locality. Of course, language, culture, and specific geographies matter. All Indigenous peoples are not the same like as if I would be saying that, but uh, I think some people think, oh, that's what you're saying. No, well, here's what I'm saying is, is there are certain principles that are indigenous education that operate cross nationally, internationally across different indigenous nations. And they're worth thinking about. They're, we're thinking about how people related, how they saw education as that principle of growth and how they saw treaty making as a possibility to create healthy and positive relationships into the future. That's what it looks like and no surprise, the tree.
here we are with the tree. The First Nations Holistic Lifelong Learning Model, which is from the Canadian Council of Learning, worked with Indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples came up with this model. And it's that uh, the tree is the way in which we will enact education. We will look at it together, bring those things that we bring to the table, and then grow fully out into the world itself. There's a reason why this, uh, from our community models, uh, Indigenous education, which we did for thousands of years to great success, incredible, uh, you know, people's most innovative uh, peoples who were able to enact treaty and make things happen. Um, you know, for instance, uh, uh, there's a reason why massive amounts of Indigenous governments, uh, the French did so well in their early trade going into lower Ontario, uh, what becomes Ontario. You know, Anishinaabe incredibly successful nations, uh, and it was based on this model of education of and, uh, you know, marrying into French families, for example. But yet somehow something along the way changed. Somehow things went from and to or, from success to whatever it is now, I wouldn't call it failure, but for success to whatever it looks like now. And what it might be manifested best is to look at completion rates or graduation rates in schooling for Indigenous peoples. You know, we can talk about all day about why Indigenous peoples are not succeeding in the school system. Uh, we can say things like, okay, well, it has to do with residential schooling. It has to do with trauma and mistrust involving uh, Indigenous people's trust of the education system. It can involve a whole bunch of truck structural challenges, involves things like uh, uh, Indigenous peoples having lack of uh, access to libraries, for example, the internet, having the lack of access to uh, adequate supports on First Nations education systems or in urban spaces, in downtown areas where a lot of poverty exists for Indigenous peoples, uh, particularly here in Winnipeg. We can talk for all day about why is it that completion rates are so porous. We can you know, go down to the very nuance and we can say, okay, why are Indigenous peoples not getting to convocation or graduation or grade nine graduation or whatever it might be? And we can point out all these different things. We can say literacy and numeracy, and we can say things like attendance rates and truancy. Um, you know, I've worked with every single school district that I've ever worked with and you know, probably, I don't know, several hundred by this point. Um, uh, and every single one of them really focuses on these kinds of numerics. Uh, these linchpin things that we determine for the success for schooling, which is almost exclusively completion, graduation. That's almost the only way that school deems success. Like there is no, think about the report cards. There is no area with the exception of maybe kindergarten, grade one or something like that, where they assess sharing or they assess pride or they assess uh, relationships with one another. There is no barometer for any of that. There is only one barometer, and it's the grade leading to get the credit to get to graduation. And that's it. Even at you know grade one, grade two level, uh, there's only an interest in, do, are you going to finish? Did you reach the barometer of success, which is completion in some way? This is what that formula looks like. Here's what the formula looks like. So. Uh, the formula, formula for student success generally looks like this. Every student comes with potential. We offer opportunity as teachers. We give them a classroom space, textbooks, access to learning. Sometimes opportunity might be some sort of sense of inclusion in some way. Uh, we might say to ourselves, okay, well, we are going to make a territorial acknowledgement. That's part of our opportunity giving. And then what we do is we make the determinations on relevance. Now, relevance is exclusively did they finish? Now, it might not always be certificate, right? Uh, or it might not always be like graduation. It might be certificate. It might be, did they get to a point A to point B? Um, but we always assess point B. We're always like, it is inevitable that relevance has everything to do with, did they finish? Did they graduate? Did they get to this particular set of skill set that we've decided that is important for them to know? And how do we deem that? Almost exclusively a test in some way. Now, success is, did they finish? And if the answer is yes, then we got success. Now, schooling does a terrible job with assessing the post lives of students, but I can guarantee to you that if students do finish, 
uh, and if they go to somehow onto a university, then the society deems success as picket fence, uh, stock holding, um, pension, uh, full time job, uh, car. Like that's how society deems success. Society doesn't deem success. Uh, and arguably, this is, of course, an arguable point, but society doesn't deem success on your pride or your sense of self-worth or your sense of, uh, of uh, even if you are a good parent, uh, society doesn't deem success in those ways. It's most often tangible. It's most often very uh, material and it's most often built on profit because that's the great Canadian story. So here's the thing about it is, is no wonder Indigenous students don't succeed in this model because none of this is about Indigenous peoples. Almost all of this is about, for the most part, taking the land, profiting from the land, uh, having a certain relationship with the land, uh, and not, certainly not having relationships with other people uh, because we don't assess things like that as success. And did you finish? Were you out to go get the picket fence house or the house of the picket fence? and you know, 2.5 children or whatever, whatever it is. That's the problem here is that there is a gap in the ways in which Indigenous peoples view success. Think back to Peter Jones now, to Kakawakanabe. What did he see as success? It was the healthy relationship between a father and a son and how schooling could be used to facilitate that relationship and how we deem success, which is, did they get the certificate at the end? Did they get the graduation rate at the end? Did they get the diploma? There is a massive disconnect between the ways in which Indigenous education works and what it seeks, what kind of success models it looks for, and then what the schooling system expects of Indigenous students. It's almost like absolute opposite directions. The school system wants you to move as far away from your community as possible. Go to Toronto, get rich, get a nice car. The schooling system almost never creates you into a person in which you go back to your community. Like occasionally that happens, but it's despite the school system. It's not because of the school system, because the school system's encouraging you to go to university, go forth and go and achieve. What's the great narrative is go forth and make your fortune, right? That's the, that's the great statement that we say to students. Uh, enact anything, you can become anything that you want, go forth and good luck and everything like that. Like nobody says in their good luck speeches, okay, everybody, go home now, spend time with your grandmother. Go home now, go help build the internet on your First Nation. Like uh, people might say, you know, go give back once in a while to your community, but it's not something that's valued. And for Indigenous peoples, that's what's valued. The most important aspect of why Indigenous peoples go to school is because of mystery. It's because of getting to know the tree, getting to know the relationships with the land and with the people who get to see the tree in other ways, because how they view the tree is how we too wish to view the tree together. We may not always agree, but that our relationality will help us to know more about the tree. The only thing we're really gonna learn from all of that is there's always more to know. And then we tell each other our creation stories and we say, what do you think about creation? What do you think about the world? And at the end of the day, we have something together and we'll call that a treaty. Here's the problem with Indigenous education is that everything I just described to you that is healthy relationships and, um, you know, safe environments or, or certainly um, environments that look for uh, inclusion or that look for uh, aspects of changing the massive systemic discrimination and inequalities is that all that's deemed extra. It's like the same level as a sports team or an extracurricular or a lunch hour program. It can be cut on a Friday. If you're doing Indigenous education and your program, your class, your initiative, whatever it looks like, can be cut on a Friday. It's not Indigenous education. Let me say that again. So I really don't care what you what you're talking about here. It could be a language program. It could be a territorial acknowledgement. It could be a huge amount of on the land learning. If it can be cut on a Friday, you're not doing Indigenous education. And here's why is because it's not woven into the life of the school. It's not 
connected to the school. It's not intricate to the school. It's not essential to the school. That's what Indigenous education is. Indigenous education is a fully relevant system that connects people and talks about the healthy relationships of potential within that space. And the fact is that we don't have willpower to enact that because we're too busy going, OK, well, the important stuff is math. The important stuff is science. The important stuff is like reading, writing, arithmetic, all that stuff. And I know that we're all into brain research now and doing different things and you know multiple learnings, all that kind of stuff. Indigenous education gets cut, cut of that too. And they say things like, okay, well, uh, you know, smudging was good for this little initiative that we did over here, but oh, we're all done with that now. Why do we have to keep doing it? Or or why do we have to keep uh, funding those things? Or or you know, that's just like another. Thing that we can add to our schedule and i know that teachers have lack of resources i know teachers are nervous the thing i hear the most from teachers is i'm scared to implement this because i'm scared to do more damage what i always say to that is if you don't teach it then what have you done i would say it's far more violent to erase indigenous education from the landscape than it is to try it and then potentially if you make a mistake and newsflash you will uh it's like you'll learn People will help you. People will appreciate the gesture. And yeah, sometimes people say rough, harsh things, but that's because there's 150 years of mistrust and violence that we have to work, work against. And a little bit of discomfort might help the system. It might help us grow a little bit, it might help us get beyond this disconnect. Because the fact is, I know that you are stressed. I know that educators are demanded more than anyone else in the world, but we have reality to deal with. Here's the reality. The reality is that we have uh, an education system and educate a world a country that is becoming more and more indigenous. And if they're not becoming more and more indigenous in certain elements, so if you take a look at this map, uh, the biggest red dots are the populations of indigenous peoples. Where's the biggest red dot? Well, of course, it's Winnipeg, Treaty 1. Uh, it's, of course, Regina, Saskatoon, uh, Edmonton, Calgary. But I want you to look at Southern Ontario. If you look at Southern Ontario, that's actually the largest population of Indigenous peoples in the country. You in Ontario have three times the amount of, four, five times the amount of people that we have here in Manitoba, but proportionately, you are not as big as Manitoba. Sorry, there was a slide missing there. So you are proportionally less than Manitoba, but you still have more Indigenous peoples. And there are more and more Indigenous peoples growing every single day. When I talk in March, I'm going to show you the numbers, but I can tell you this, uh, Indigenous peoples are growing at 42.5%. That's virtually every second Indigenous person is doubling themselves. That means that's like impossible, right? Well, yes, because more people are claiming indigeneity than ever before. But that being said, it just tells you how the country is becoming more and more indigenous. That means if you cannot work with indigenous peoples, if you cannot understand the issues involving indigenous peoples, frankly, you can't work in the system. In Manitoba, you definitely cannot because it's 20% of every single uh, student population, every single you know person within Winnipeg, every single person in the province, 20% of them are Indigenous. That's clients, markets, uh, workplaces, all of that stuff. Uh, that's what working in Manitoba is like. You have to be competent on Indigenous issues. But in Ontario, it's coming. It will get there. It may already be there in particular areas like your community as well. So the fact is that we have to be able to look at schooling in a much more radically different way. We have to be able to look at success and understand that success, in order for success to operate, we have to look at some radically different ways to teach, to counsel, to create policies, to invite our community to participate. Uh, we have to invite people to come into our school that perhaps haven't been seen or given the same power as educators. We have to look at our formalized curriculum of what we teach in classrooms. But I'm not actually worried too much about classrooms because I'm seeing classrooms move much faster than the hallway. Because the fact is that whatever we teach in the classroom, and I'll speak about this in March, uh, in my workshops in March, is that uh, the classroom is important, but it's not anywhere near as important as the hallway because they learn far more in the hallway than they ever do in the classroom. Uh, why do I know that? Uh, ask any student what they like the best about school. None of them will say algebra. Not one. Not one will say Romeo and Juliet. Not one of them will say uh, this physics equation or this math equation. None of them will even say gym. Uh, what they're going to say is my friends. Or they're going to say the band trip. Or they're going to say the hockey team. Because we don't teach curriculum. We teach relationships in schools. 
And so we'd be best served to think, well, if relationships are what drives all of this, and we stop living under the illusion that we just drop in the TRC curriculum and somehow that's going to make reconciliation. No, it isn't. We have to deal with the hallways. We have to deal with the office. We have to deal with the library. We have to deal with the intercom far more than we have to deal with the classroom. I'm not saying lesson plans don't matter. I'm just saying lesson plans alone will actually create more conflict, but not less because they're going to go in the hallway and they're going to go, why did the hallway have nothing to do with what I just learned? Why is the office has nothing to do with what I just learned? Like uh, I talk about more of this in March, but at the at the University of Manitoba, we've had to radically change, and we're not perfect by any means. Let me tell you, lots of uh, conflicts, lots of growth, lots of discussions, and when I say discussions, I mean uncomfortable discussions for the past three decades uh, at the university, which has involved a whole lot of really uh, difficult decisions. But, you know, going back to the 1970s, which is when Indigenous students first started showing up, uh, one thing that we noticed was A, uh, Indigenous students were not succeeding within the institution because of some profound issues of systemic racism, expectation, notions of success within the system itself, and that when we changed those, we got a much better outcome. When we uh, went to ourselves, well, maybe that Indigenous students bring different expectations to education, and we began to shift things. We began to say, oh, okay, well, that means we have to create welcome and fostering places for Indigenous students to thrive, to feel safe, to be able to take the world uh, that they often have not received those things and to facilitate those things, and that will facilitate their success, bring ceremony into it, bring elders uh, role models, like for example, so uh, at Egamik, our Indigenous Student Center, we began to teach students that Indigenous voices matter, Indigenous places matter, languages matter, and that we talk about all of those things. We do a treaty initi initiative that we talk about how treaties matter, and then students start to thrive. And we have arguably some of the most uh, thriving students in North America coming from the University of Manitoba, all of them getting employment, all of them getting success, why? Because we work on notions of success that are Indigenous centered, that give them stronger relationships with their community, not lesser relationships. We, one of the things we say in our graduation speeches, we have one of the largest graduation powwows in North America, is we say, now it's your job to go create two of you. Go back to your community, be a mentor, be a supporter, be a person who lives and works and, and enables your community, know your language, know where you come from, support your elders and support other people to come to the university or to come other places, wherever they wish to go. Try, try to create healthy communities on wherever you go. And that's what your success is, not in your ability to go out now and go to this industry and become just a world leader. You may do that, that may be part of it, but your expectation is, is that you must go bring your community with you support your community as you go along. And here's some examples of who those students are. So this is Nathan Legacy, top left-hand picture here. This, uh, he got the first master's degree in North America on Indigenous video games. Uh, this is right here, uh, Angelina McLeod, just below him right there. Uh, that's, uh, she did a Duke master's degree, or is doing a master's degree on the stolen scrolls from her community and helping them repatriate them. Uh, this is Jonathan Coachman down at the bottom here. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, but uh, believe me when you when I say he's pretty awesome is writing a Cree opera. Uh, this is Ashley Richard right here. She's doing a uh, master's degree or finished a uh, or sorry, an upper level honors degree on indigenous business on on ethical indigenous businesses, not based on profit, but look more like co-ops. Anyways, my point of telling you all of this is that when you foster indigenous success, then remarkable things happen. We teach students that treaty is not just something that we say at the start of a meeting, but treaty is something that we live, that we're treaty people. And that means everything we do have to do with treaty. Every single law, every single interaction, every single project in the city has to think about treaty. And so we talk about uh, what treaty looks like. And, and this is Braden Harper right here, who is one of our students. And I started working for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. And uh, one of the things that he said is by working with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers was, he said, well, treaty is something that we are uh, about sharing the land, but what's football? Football's about stealing the land. That's what football's all about. And I don't mean to shatter any of the ideas of football for you, but football mm -hmm. is all about stealing the land. 
And so therefore, if we look at football as a principle, as a project, as a story, then maybe we before we do something that's going to involve uh, stealing the land, celebrating stealing the land, no wonder Indigenous icons are so important for those narratives, uh, that maybe we can talk about being treaty person. So that the end of that project will still be relatives, we'll still think about each other, and maybe we can stop uh, celebrating stories about stealing the land. Uh, I don't have a problem with football, by the way. Uh, it's more a problem of the story. And if we only tell the story of stealing the land, no wonder that's what we always do. Uh, or can, that's what Canada always does. Well, notice that the, the Jets and the Bomber, or sorry, the Jets started to look to what the Bombers did, first Indigenous sports franchise in North America to do territorial acknowledgement. And then the Oilers started doing it uh, from Edmonton, the hockey team, and then uh, the Winnipeg Jets as well. And I know this because I wrote this for the Winnipeg Jets. And the Winnipeg Jets uh, now make a territorial acknowledgement right beside the, the, the anthem. And then they started doing other things. They started inviting Indigenous peoples to open up games for them. They indigenized their logo. Uh, they began to have throat singers uh, at a game. They had uh, Métis bands playing at the intermissions. And then they did this about a week before or you know, a couple weeks before the pandemic. I'm not sure if you can hear this, but just uh, tell me if you can hear it. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Bell MTS Place welcome to the Strong Warrior Girls Anishinaabe Singers, who will perform our national anthem in Ojibwe. I'm going to tell you that singing O Canada in Ojibwe to changes very little, changes almost nothing. In fact, uh, we should think about the ways in which our own songs can have those same kind of reactions within non-Indigenous community. However, uh, we have to remember that O Canada uh, or the Ojibwe language was banned in schools until the 1960s. So we're we're looking at some pretty big change over 50 years, and now children are learning their own language within those schools, and they're being celebrated for it. That's the kind of innovative change that happens, and the reason why I bring that up is because none of this happens without Braden. When we prepare Indigenous young people to have pride in their communities, pride in their culture, pride in their language, then they start to build their own community. And when they build their own community, then the world begins to shift and there's hundreds of them coming. And when they build that, then they begin in to build indigenous spaces, which benefit everyone. And one of the things that happens in indigenous spaces here at the University of Manitoba in, is that we not only support indigenous students, but we also give a home for non-indigenous students as well, who begin to become more competent, who become more employable, who become more able to make decisions based in competency, to based in cultural fluency of living within Manitoba. And there are better off creating a society with less conflict, not more. That is the power of what we might call reconciliation looks like. If we adopt Indigenous principles within schools, which is the thing that we've been lacking perhaps the most, healthy relationships, relationships with the land, relationships with the language of this territory, which is embedded in history and politics and experience, we begin to notice a few things. We notice that Canadians are already aware there's a problem. They know there's a lack. Uh, one of the things that you can say uh, in this slide right here is a few things. One is that Indigenous peoples understand that Indigenous, non-Indigenous peoples understand that Indigenous peoples have been excluded, they've been discriminated against, and that most Canadians want something to happen. 84% want reconciliation to occur, they just don't know what it looks like. 
So what I, this is what I do. I go around the country and I say, this is what reconciliation looks like. It's healthy and positive relationships based on Indigenous values, those values which have been most often ostracized and marginalized from the system itself, but yet live in things like treaty. But those are the things we have most lacked in school. We try to bring them in once in a while. We try to say things like, oh, sharing or community matters. But then when it comes to graduation, it really doesn't matter. It really doesn't. It matters what the grade is. It matters who finished. It matters who was the most competitive. But yet when we're talking about Indigenous values, it's not that those things aren't capable and having a meaningful place. It's that balance is crucial. And so when I look across the country and I say, what are the most successful initiatives? Here they are. And you could look at them on the slides that I've offered to you. I've given Joe the copy of all my slides. These are the most successful initiatives for Indigenous and Canadian students across the country. Their cultural support programs, their mentorship programs, student advocacy, listening to the students speak, their Indigenous pedagogies, multi-senses of gender, and et cetera, work, uh, work, work programs and so on. But if I were to boil all these down, and I don't have much more time, so I would boil them down into four different elements. There's relationships at the head of this, there's relevancy in the head of it, but Indigenous relevancy, not Canadian relevancy, which is only based on did they finish. Indigenous relevancy is, do they have a good pride and self-worth? Do they know their language? Do they have a relationship with their cookum? Do they have a relationship with the land? Though that's where Indigenous sensibility is so crucial because it gives students a much wider sense of relevancy than just did they finish. Sometimes did they finish includes those things, but not often. Then it's usually did they perform on the test? Uh, respect, do I feel acknowledged and so on, and responsibility. Now, if we incorporate those things into the system as I described it, then we get a much different formula. And this is what it looks like. The formula for Indigenous student success looks like this. Students are still coming with potential and, and we're providing opportunity. That's the same. But then not only do we provide a sense of we got to get them finished, that's Canadian relevancy, but that we got to, Indigenous relevancy is do they have better relationships? Do they know the language of the territory that they come from? Do they know the history of where they come from? Do they understand violence and oppression? And that those things that we as Indigenous peoples are interested in and talk about and, and also employ within our education system, then people become competent and they can understand the world they live in. And then what happens is we have respect and, and we respect that all students come to this situation. Uh, we come and every single time that we give respect in every program and every project, every territorial acknowledgement, we multiply the potential for success. And then each person that is competent and creates healthy relationships with those Canadian and Indigenous students, we exponentially grow the sense of success. And pretty soon we realize, oh, okay, so students are not only coming out with success in terms of understanding Canadian relevancy finishing, but that Indigenous relevancy comes with relationality and that we begin to go curriculum, relationships can operate together. And that's what creates success. Because success is about how the responsibilities that we create all students to have in relation to the communities in which they live, which Indigenous peoples are centrally a part, more and more and more. And that's how we create a world in which Indigenous student success is possible. And that will also be the world in which all students have success. The question that we have to do is how do we begin to look at reconciliation together, offer our solutions together and see the future? That's how we see the future together. We understand that Indigenous peoples are thoroughly and fully a part of every single element of our education system into the future and they're not some optional thing on a Friday, but they are fully, Paul, fully, absolutely centrally part of every step of the future that we take together. And that will be how our children will inherit the future in a meaningful kind way. And just maybe, just maybe uh, education will be able to empower people to be able to enact those relationships into the future. And Peter Jones saw it, Kakawakanabe saw it, and you too, I hope you saw it a little bit in this presentation today. So with that, I say a huge miigwech and thank you for your time. I'm happy to stick around for some questions or comments or I love comments more than questions because it tells me where you're thinking and what your, what your feedback is. Uh, but it's been a real honor for me to be able to do this first step with your district. I know I'll be doing a few more in March. Uh, and so a huge miigwech and thank you. No, miigwech, Nigan. Um, yeah, we do have some time for comments and questions. 
Um, I am looking at the chat box, so uh, please uh, feel free to. Uh, what happened to Negan? Negan left for a second. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> he's done. He, he, he's he's had the, enough. The best dramatic exit I've ever taken. I was like, and thank you very much, and boom, I'm out of here. I actually, I'm not, I'm not taking questions. I'm not taking questions. He says. That's so funny. Sorry about that. A little, a little, a little Donald Trump like there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I actually went to go hit the um, uh, turn your slides off, and it just, I hit the. Sorry, hang up button. I apologize. <laughs> what a silly move that was. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, it, it was important. I let you back in though. Um, yeah, apparently. No, thank you. That the um, number a number of the topics you you uh, you spoke about today. I know our our indigenous education team uh, here in Grand Erie uh, have talked about those for for the last few years about uh, land and, and the hallways um, and and having that in in the classroom every day and. And 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 what's important about the re part I really liked most was the relationships. Uh, anytime I, I speak to teachers about that, the relationships part of it, I, I always go back to because um, I, I have had I've had a few administrators in my life um, who told me that a lot of kids aren't going to remember the math, they're not going to remember the science, but they remember that relationship you had with you when you were coaching football or when you were uh, in the Christmas assembly or just things like that that they, they've known you throughout your your career with. So. No, thank, thanks for what you what you said today. Well, I mean, nobody like like that's the thing is that 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 doesn't mean that curriculum isn't important. All I'm all I'm trying to add here is that we only focus on that as if it's the only mm -hmm. thing we teach. But the real curriculum is relationships. The best teachers, in fact, I used to be uh, when I was in faculty. Um, I read an article that says uh, relationship driven teaching, and I read it and I was like, that's the teacher I want to be. And uh, that's why I think I was a successful teacher is because uh, I cared that the students were uh, coming with their hopes and dreams and their humanity and that my job was to in enact that humanity in the best way, facilitate that humanity to the best that it can be. And, and what I realized was is that when I facilitated a student's humanity, uh, it often meant that that at times they were not ready to finish and that the system didn't have any room for that. And that my only decision was, did they get the, did they finish X number of assignments and get to the 78 or whatever it is, or the grade or whatever it might be. Um, and the fact is that students grow at different ways and different methods. And therefore, if we don't have room for that, then we determine that uh, students are just a bunch of robots. Mm -hmm. We do have one person with their hand up. Oh, she put it down. Vanessa, you had your hand up. You wanted to uh, say something to uh, Nigan? Um, I did, but I think I'm too nervous to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, there's no reason. Are you scared it's of a little, <laughs> It might be uh, provocative, so no, I, please. Didn't say it. I just don't get, um, you know. I loved your talk. It was the most inspiring um, Zoom I've been on in a long, long time. So, Shimei, for your time and your teachings. Um, I, I'm taking, I took tons of notes. Um, what I wanted to bring up was at the end, you had said a few comments regarding uh, Canadian versus Indigenous identity. And this is something I wanted to touch on is I live in Canada but I'm like none of my family is from here originally. We're all like immigrants. So from that lens, sometimes it doesn't compute with me. So I'm neither of those things. And so I we're talking about um, Anishinaabe culture and it, I forget how you said it so eloquently, but it was like adding to, you were adding to it. It wasn't this or that, it was in addition. And I love that idea, and I would love to see somehow that being reflected in the notion of being Canadian itself. Because I cannot, you know, I even just as a white person, I don't want to have any connection to that 
history. Like, it's so awful to me. Like, I don't want to have that part of my identity. I don't want to know that my ancestors came and did these horrible things. You know, so being, um, like I said, not from that past per se, I still connect because I'm, I'm from Europe. So those ideologies were there and present. And that is something that um, I've time to learn about um, through cultural collective trauma, uh, specifically with World War II and uh, in that past, not um, Indigenous culture per se. But anyways, I, that was where it's not really a comment or a question. It's just that's no, I, what came I to mind. Appreciate everything you say. So miigwech for all that bravery. I know it was a. Uh, uh, it can be intimidating to talk on these things, and uh, but uh, miigwech for that. Uh, I'll just say a few t things in response. I think that are really important. Um, the first part was you're talking about uh, some discomfort involving that history and uh, you know attaching yourself to the history. And I absolutely can appreciate that that history. Uh, most oftentimes, because it was so brutally violent for Indigenous peoples and most markedly favoring non-Indigenous peoples, particularly those from Europe that have uh, dispossessed Indigenous peoples, uh, starved them out of their lands, uh, out of our lands, and then doing terrible things like the removal that I've had uh, in my community. But what I can say is that it, you know, owning it or in uh, recognizing it as an inheritance is not to say you were responsible. It's not to say you're, you're guilty for something. It's to say that you inherit that responsibility to, in order to enact change in it. And it sounds like you're doing that and, and that's great. Um, it's, it's to recognize that things have happened and therefore we can't go in a time machine and change those things, but we also have a responsibility to now, okay, we're in an egregious situation and therefore like uh, we're not gonna deny that that it's that it didn't happen. So we're going to say, OK, well, in downtown Winnipeg, 80 percent of the homeless population are indigenous peoples. That was intentional and meant to be that way. Therefore, we're still in the system that is producing that outcome. Therefore, we need to tackle the system in a meaningful way. And we are part of the system. We're teachers within that system. Therefore, we have a responsibility to play in order to change it. Um, third, second thing of what you said there, which was that uh, uh, to be to recognize that uh, trying to just make sure that I remember what you said on the first part there, which was that uh, to be um, oh that that Canadian identity should be opened up a little bit. I think Canadian identity purports itself to be, which is the great lie. Canadian says Canadian identity says oh we're multiculturalism oh we recognize all people and cultures. No, you don't. It's like English and French is all that matters. And then look at the ways in which the system produces, like who are all the politicians? We've never had an indigenous person represent indigenous nations who are in government. Uh, so therefore indigenous peoples are not welcome in government. So we should stop pretending this lie that Canada is this inclusive place. And I think that's gonna get us a lot farther. And that's not to say Canada is this terrible, you know, quagmire of a place. It certainly is, uh, per, you know, has committed genocide. Uh, but it's it's to recognize the truth of the situation, and therefore we can we can we can deal with truth. We can't deal with lies because when the, when Canada purports to be a place that is like we are inclusive, we are not the United States, we are this fully uh, maple syrupy flagging place. Um, it's just to to buy into a lie, and it, we can't work with lies. We must work with truth. I love that. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think we go through the chat. There's a few chats um, in here uh, from uh, JP. My feeling about indigenous education is that is more relevant for indigenous and non-indigenous le learners than Eurocentric education since we're on this land and not in Europe. This idea is inspired in part by Alfred Manapis, who says that books must not replace our grandparents. I also draw from Batiste, that was from Aiken in 1999. I also draw from Batiste, uh, who states indigenous knowledge includes indigenous science, arts, humanities, legal traditions. Each manifestation reflects an ecologically centered way of life or expresses a uh, sustainable humanity. Given this idea and articles 14, 15, and 21 from UNDRIP, how do you feel about the housing independent indigenous education schools within existing underutilized public schools uh, complete with indigenous administration? This would allow Indigenous students and non-Indigenous students to be together and both and have both options, elementary or Euro and, and Indigenous knowledge. 
I think that would be a perfect, that'd be a perfect system if we had uh, the kind of vision and the competency at the leadership within those non-Indigenous school systems to, to adequately support Indigenous education systems. But the fact is, and I say this with all kindness and respect, we don't have many administrators, educational administrators, administrators in this country who are competent, who are able to be able to adequately supervise Indigenous education programs. And evidence is in virtually every single district I've ever worked in, uh, the Indigenous education lead or whatever their position is, Indigenous vice principal or in charge of Indigenous education, whatever it might be, is constantly dealing with legitimating their job. Like as if that's a conversation. And, and the whole idea of that is just evidence to me that the people who are employing this, they know it's necessary, but they have no idea what it looks like because they're not able to take direction. They haven't been prepared adequately for those jobs. And they keep seeing Indigenous education as something extra. It's like something that we have to just like, like Doug Ford cut it on a Friday. Like, and that's the premier of the province. And I'm not, you know, using him as a barometer of excellence. I'm just saying that's what Ontarians voted in and therefore, there's that's where we're at. We're at educationally, in terms of the majority or the so-called majority of edu of Ontarians. If that's where we think Indigenous education is at. It can be cut on a Friday. Then that's where we're at. And so, do, do, in that system, I don't think Indigenous education will thrive. Therefore, we have to build our own systems outside of the current educational model until such time that we get competent administrators, competent people who are within the system and within government that can lead and understand that Indigenous education isn't something that's like just, uh, you know, as about as useful as the chess club. Great, thank you. Um, some more comments. Thank you, Nigan. I love the focus on relationships. Thank you very much. Thank you for the experience. Uh, thank you. Your insights and experiences are much appreciated. Who wrote relationship driven teaching? Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking, you know, when I was in faculty, it was like dinosaurs roamed the earth and it was 1998. Oh, geez. <laughs> like, I even, was there even electricity in those days? I don't know. I would There's say a few relationship driven treat teaching and maybe, and then maybe PDF and you'll find something. I'm hoping. All right. Uh, oh, comment for our speaker. Don't be nervous. Um, the one who, who put her hand up. Um, this had really added a new level of my understanding of how COVID has negatively imp impacted Indigenous kids in the school simply because so much of the relationship piece of school has been stripped by the protocol. We will certainly need extra attention to this going forward. Uh, I, I gave it, I've give, been giving talks, uh, you can find it on YouTube. It's called uh, how, um, how pandemics can't, or I don't know, something about, Indeed, I can't remember my own title, but it's like <laughs> it's like uh, how from pandemics to trauma or from trauma to pandemics, in how, how indigenous futures will save us. And so it talks about how uh, indigenous peoples have dealt with pandemics before. We know how to deal with them. And most oftentimes we will um, we've turned away from what indigenous peoples can teach us about how they've dealt with pandemics, how we've dealt with pandemics. So great on YouTube. And Another uh, comment, your insights are so helpful to us as we work to do better. Relationships are so important. I also like the humor at the end with the mic drop, as humor is so important to relationships too. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, you, you, so you, did that, you did that on purpose. I know you did that on purpose to get a laugh. I knew that. <laughs> My idiocy just... <laughs> <laughs> I like that it's on recording too. So it's like, yeah. boom, I just, I'm out of here. <laughs> Um, <laughs> wonderful presentation. Looking forward to your one in March. Um, we cannot change what we do not acknowledge. Uh, nice, com good comment. Uh, very true. We need to start making our classrooms inclusive and focus on what we can control to start. Well said. Uh, from Lisa Monroe, one of our, our superintendents. Uh, thank you for pushing my thinking and reflection on what non-Indigenous persons define as success for Indigenous students. You've compelled me to think beyond credit accumulation rates, credit rates, grad rates, et cetera, but rather the importance of connection, um, where am I lost myself? Community and relationships as measures of success. I challenge myself to reflect on what this, this action looks like for me in my work going forward. Many thanks, Nigan. 
Great. And the last comment here uh, from JP, uh, he had the rather long about the, uh, the the two sets of admin, indigenous and, and non-indigenous. I was thinking of two rows of admin working together, both directors equal. I think he, I think that's a pretty powerful vision, and it's exactly what the Roe Commission called for, which was that indigenous peoples working uh, in our own systems often alongside and in collaboration with those who we share these territories with. And I think certainly the Tura Wampum, the Geshwenta, uh, has a lot to teach us about those models. Great. Thank you for your courage to say hard words. One thing that confuses me is why are these workshops not mandatory? We're working on we're, we're working on that. I don't think that's a question for me. So. <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah, no, we're working on it. Um, thank you for for this powerful message for no, those non-Indigenous educators who may be new on their journey of Indigenous education. Is there a book or resource you can often suggest as a starting point? Uh, well, I tell all non-Indigenous peoples that they, everyone should read Inconvenient Indian. I think it's just a great book. I think it's great. It's written. It's a wonderful narrative that thinks a lot about some of the broader issues of society that are very helpful. But in terms of non-Indigenous uh, peoples reading into education, anything by Marie Batiste is very powerful and very useful. Uh, very useful for me when I was uh, in faculty. And there was also a lot of really great stuff that's been done by um, um, Eve Tuck is great. She's been doing some great stuff. Uh, um, I don't know, like uh, this is, I think, a good question for Joe to provide some resources from uh, on how to support non-Indigenous educators in your space. I feel like me offering you Manitoba people would not be useful. Because there's a bunch okay. of people here in Manitoba that are great. Christine Emlot is somebody who's local, who's working great here in Winnipeg on lots of materials for non-Indigenous peoples, um, on so the often called settler allies. I just think there's some really great stuff happening on the prairies here, but maybe Joe would know some local stuff there. Yeah, um, one of our, uh, there was a comment on Dr. Pamela Toulouse. Oh yeah, definitely. Pamela. Anything yeah, by she, Pamela, she, we share a publisher, she's fantastic. Yeah, and we have this uh, this website that we, we share. It's the uh, First Nations Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario website, where there's tons of resources that a lot of the Indigenous uh, educators in our province kind of put together as one, one central hub uh, for information. So, um, and all our teachers have access to that. Um, and if you, you don't know how to just, just give me an email and I'll, I'll hook you up. Yep. Um, let's see. Chibi Gwetch, JP Métis from Penetanguishing. Uh, thank you. Is that JP? <laughs> That's JP from Penetanguishing. <laughs> oh, nice. I was just talking to Liz about you the other day there, JP. Thank you. I will reflect on how this is from uh, another uh, superintendent. Thank you. I'll reflect on how we focus on relationships, relevance, respect and responsibility as part of system supports for Indigenous students. Looking forward to March. 21 things you should know about the Indian Act. Uh, yeah, suggested so reading. That was good. Yep. It's a good one. As a school principal. OK, we're going to shut down pretty soon. Here. We're, I think we're a little over time. A few more comments. Uh, as, a school, as a school principal, I really appreciate your notion that we need to focus on the learning taking place in the halls of our schools. You have challenged me to create ways that will foster this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my workshop in March is, is actually how to do that. So it's a four part workshop where we work on curriculum. Uh, it's, well, it's only a one hour talk, but we'll do curriculum. We'll do unsaid curriculum, which is environment, and then we'll do community and then we'll do professional or institutional development. So we'll do all four in that one hour. So Great, thank you. Uh, Chimi Gwetch, I'm so happy to be able to hear you speak. Marianne Bonchere, Algonquin First Nation. Uh-oh, whatever JP meant by uh-oh. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. That's from, from hearing me talk, <laughs> talk to Liz. So. <laughs> <laughs> this has been so insightful. As a drama teacher, I've seen how focusing on building relationships affects students positively. Uh, Michelle Moniz put a website, People for Education, What Matters in Indigenous Education. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Uh, so excited for March now. Um, and that's it. Um, yeah, so um, uh, Denise, will you uh, address the March uh, question, please? 
Absolutely, and uh, welcome again to uh, Six Nations Mississaugas at the Credit Territory um, in um, what we call the two row uh, on Palm Belt and the Dish with no Two Spoons um, here in Ontario. Really happy to have you here. For those of you joining us and asking uh, about uh, the March session, um, my name is Denise Martins. I'm the Superintendent of Education with the Grand Area District School Board responsible for Indigenous education and this wonderful team bringing um, all of these insights and uh, learning and reflection here today. Um, the session that uh, Nigan speaks about in March will be for our system administrators in Grand Erie and our managers. Um, we will be rolling out um, a cult cultural competency training in the next uh, month or so. Um, teachers and other support staff in our system will have the benefit of participating in that uh, six part series starting next year. But we are starting with our administrators and it sounds like we're starting in the right place uh, again from your speech today. So miigwech and for those of you just be patient with us as we get the rest of our series to you. And we have one last question from Marianne before we uh, ask Sherry to close for us. Go ahead uh, Marianne. Oh, you typed it out. Okay, let me see here. How can yeah. I get involved with the yeah, ages? Edu kiddo. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I, I I have my kiddos here with me. I was just trying to uh, find out, and it has, I'm sorry, nothing to do with the meeting today, but I want to know how I can get um, involved with the um, education, um, Indigenous education team, just because I'm new to Grand Erie, and I have been with the boards I was with in the past, but uh, I was really excited to be here today. But I can get in. I can get in touch with you about that later because my daughter wants to do nail polish. So we'll talk to you for a bit. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll send. I'll send you an email tomorrow, Marianne. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and um, as we're getting very close to the end here, can I? Uh...